I'm Roseanne. I'm Elliot. And I'm Shelley. I remember when it was that time, the couple of weeks before, and it was like, oh, what's going to happen? Are we going to go in lockdown? And, you know, it, initially it felt like, oh, it's just a cold. What's all the fuss about? I remember we went to the supermarket and we got some shopping and we went a couple of days and every time we went, they sort of got less and less in the shops and this really weird sense yeah. of like, what's going to happen? Yeah. When, do you remember just before it happened, all, it all really happened, we went on holiday, we were, went to Athens, didn't yeah. we? And we flew back in and it was all just getting odder and odder as we were there and things were shutting down. And we flew back into Gatwick and there was no one there. Gatwick was empty. empty. It was so weird, wasn't it? And yeah. then, we, then it was a bit of a, for me, okay, things are, things are happening and things are going to be really different for a while. Yeah. This isn't just a little thing, this is, this is a big deal. Yeah, it's like a every person thing. Mm. What do you remember about lockdown? Um, I couldn't see my friends. Yeah, that was tricky, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I think you got quite sad. Yeah. I think I think it made you feel quite miserable. You yeah. Couldn't see your friends. But we spent lots of time together, didn't we? Yeah. The three of us. Um, Playing games. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, you for a while you stopped going to nursery, and Ma stopped working, and then was at home looking after you. And was, I. That was the first lockdown. That was the second yeah. lockdown, Elliot. Couldn't go to school. Yeah. So that was quite different again. I just remember, in a way, everything just got really kind of simple like we didn't do anything we didn't make any plans we just stayed at home I mean I did the shopping I did I went into one shop a week you know I did Morrison's on a on a weekend and that was the only shop and it was so strange it was perfect for you though <laughs> yeah. it was just really yeah really odd I work for the NHS um so I carried on going into work um not not too far but there was a kind of in the NHS we were told to stop seeing clients. I work in a, a mental health service and we were told, you know, don't just see people who are in crisis. But it was, as a team, we were trying to work out, you know, what are we doing? How are we going to operate? And I think we started using, like, video conferencing for the first time, which was really strange. And, of course, in the mental health team, you're helping clients who are going through their own thing. But in the lockdown, everyone was going through it. As staff, we were going through the same mm-hmm. thing that clients were going through. So being able to separate what's going on for us as staff and what's going on for clients just was really, really tricky. And, and weirdly quiet as we cancelled all our routine work. Um, but then also, you know, trying to kind of find ways to make contact with people and check that everyone was OK. Yeah, was was just really, really draining and, and that everyone being in that zone where everything's uncertain and it's just not clear, you know, how we how is this going to end? How are we going to get over this? I think as well, you work with older adults, don't you? So there was all the stuff that was starting to come through mm. around um, people going back into care homes and, and huge COVID rates in the area you were working in and how... Yeah how profoundly impactful that was on staff as well not just yes um you know there's a there's a lot there to process around what's going on with your client group yes um in terms of the individuals but also in terms of the bigger picture i think yes. your service really saw yes and the way that we work with people is by connecting with people and visiting people and having those relationships and all of a sudden that was really you yeah, know stop Exactly. It was sort of only in absolute emergencies, um, which really, really changed how we connected with people and how we help people. I think I found it really odd, actually, because physically and geographically, uh, we lived in a place that was very, um, very close and it was quite closed off. It was the end of it, literally a close. Yeah, it was very quiet. It was really, really quiet and it didn't stop being quiet. And there was a road kind of at a... 90 degree angle to the end of the road we were on where you know every Thursday night everybody was out bashing pans and you know um for V day they they were all singing Vera Lynn you know and sounding like they were having a jolly old time about 11 o'clock in the morning um, but the bit we lived in was really really quiet and something I think you know we, we moved here and this is a terrace and it's a terraced row of houses and it sounds like the people here were really close-knit over um lockdown and they were all having the chairs out in the front garden and chatting to each other down the road and i'm you know it's easy to romanticize things and i'm sure there were other challenges 
But yeah, I felt a bit like we were out on a limb, actually, despite the fact that it was such a, a close environment. I think, especially reflecting on it now, it feels like it was quite isolated. And we used to see people walking past, and our friends used to come up on the way to the um, park. And I think we did have a few... Oh, look, accidentally we've bumped into somebody at the same time when we're all out for a walk. Oh, gosh, how did that happen? Sort of um, encounters, which helped. But I think, yeah, I think it was quite isolated in some ways there's something yeah. about the way it was set up that made it feel a bit more isolated you know yeah i kind of we we sort of knew one set of neighbors we had one, one, only one set of neighbors and we we knew them and we kind of knew other people by sight but we didn't really and it didn't bring us particularly close together there wasn't a whatsapp group or anything else we were yeah it was quite odd and i think you were going out to work most days mm. so it was it was quite intense i think yeah um I think especially when it was at the beginning and you guys would go out for your hour of exercise. Yeah. And and that would be it. And I think, yeah, there were people that we kind of bumped into who seemed to have the same exercise hour. Um, but it was really quite isolating. I think everything shrunk, didn't it? Every Like, the we just didn't go anywhere. And our, our like, ge- geography just got much smaller. Sort of. I mean, in, in a lot of ways, yeah. We didn't go anywhere outside folks and visit people. But I don't know if you remember, we used to go out for an hour on the bikes every day, didn't we? Around Radnor Park. Around Radnor Park and then beyond. So um, we ended up just randomly cycling down lots of roads around Folkestone <laughs> and having a look and seeing what people's houses were like and what their gardens were like and just probably going to bits of folks that we wouldn't have gone to otherwise just to have somewhere to go that wasn't just riding around Radnor Park again and again and again because <laughs> it was driving me mad. But we did do that. We did do that too. We did do that too. But I think, yeah, in a weird way, we probably saw more of Folkestone. Yeah. I remember that one day that we went... Can you remember? We, were going, we went out for a ride and there was somebody... I don't know if you do remember... outside one of the residential homes in the West End... Um, singing. She was sat outside the window and she was singing so all the people who lived in the residential home could enjoy having somebody singing and a bit of entertainment. And yeah, riding around Radnor Park and I, I, one of the things I really remember is just how, you know, all the playground was shut off, wasn't it? We couldn't play in the playground. The, the gate was shut. It was all locked. It was chained up. That's right. And do you remember all the grass got really tall? Yeah. Because no one could go there. Yeah, it was really weird, almost like an abandoned town somewhere. Yeah. Where something really bad had happened because, you know, all the grass grew up in the playground. That's a really um, quite a... a... Strange thing. Yeah, it's a really uh, kind of strong image for me of of that kind of something's gone really Mm. wrong here. Um, And it was really nice when we finally got to go back in again, wasn't it? It felt very special. How do you think we've changed? Do you think we changed? Yeah, cause, cause I've got used to not seeing my friends and right, haven't I? The idea of not seeing your friends, yeah. or actually not seeing my friends. But you do now, don't you? Yeah. What I guess for you as well, you missed some school, didn't you? Yeah. We did homeschooling, and I guess um, one of the things that's probably changed is. <laughs> I think you're a lot more resistant to doing work, doing homework than you might have been otherwise. I think I think um, I think you've changed in terms of going. Nope, home is for home, school is for school. I think sometimes you've got a definite line about that that might have been different otherwise. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's just me, but I think COVID and the lockdowns really shook a sense of security. You know that sense that generally things are going to be okay. That the world. You have your ups and downs, but by and large, things are all right and things will always Mm. be the same. And I think such a kind of that dramatic, something so bad has happened that it's fundamentally changed our freedoms, our connections. Um, Yeah, I think that it's we've I have lost a sense of safety that things generally are okay. Yeah. And I think I, I can't. I can't sort of separate that from um, Brexit and, you know, all the things that are happening this year, that sense that the world is generally bumbles along and it's generally okay and everything generally works out. And that's that's a lucky position, you know. I'm 
really aware that at different parts of the world, different parts of this country, people don't have that general sense that things will be okay and things will stay the same. But I think that insecurity is new and I think we're, we're only now just starting to get a sense of that with all the kind of, just like in the last couple of weeks, the, the rates of mental health problems in young people, uh, I think is the ripples of that uncertainty and lack of safety. I think from my perspective, in, in terms of my experience, you know, yours is very different, but my working pattern mm. and how I work has really changed. You know, I used to be out of the door most days at seven, quite often not going home until seven, eight o'clock, and really not being able to prioritise spending time at home. But of course, not being able to go forced us all to realise that we could actually work remotely or in hybrid. And I think that's changed things in terms of people's expectations around... Certainly people who do my kind of work around expectations about having time for family and that's suddenly being a, actually, I am going to prioritise being at home a bit more. Um, I do want hybrid working at the very least because it gives me opportunities to do that. I think it's had an, it's also had an impact on how people communicate with each other at work though and actually some of the relationships and looking at the relationships that we have in the team with people who've joined since COVID and since we now have moved to really a remote working pattern are different and the support is different and I think we're still working that out that's still a big swing we've, we've gone from one style of doing things to another style of doing things and we're working out on the way the things that have you know been thrown up in the air and how those are settling and I think that's about there's good and there's bad about mm. that yeah I think there's there's positives and negatives aren't there yeah we were saying only the other day we we got home and you weren't here mm. and, the, and Elliot was like what do you mean we're, and I was saying before COVID, you, you know, you four days a week, you would leave before he woke up and normally get home after he'd gone to sleep. And I think that really kind of shocked you. I think you've you've forgotten what that was like. He's just completely now got used to you being at home yeah. pretty much all of the time, <laughs> which I know sometimes can be a bit much, but I certainly think, as you say, in terms of family life... Yeah. I think it's made a really big difference, but a really positive one. Definitely. And, and looking at how I'd want to work in the future, there's no way I'd want to go back to that model. Mm. There's no way I'd want to go back to, you know, four or five days a week in the office, away from home, putting in those hours um, in in that way. I think it's just really, I think it's really negative. And I don't want to, you know, somebody who manages other people, I don't want to enable or facilitate that mm. either. I wonder if that will change Folkestone, like if there'll be just so, m there'll be many less people, leave, you know, leaving to commute every day. If there's more of an expectation that people will stay and work in Folkestone, even if they're doing it from home, how that will change how people relate to being here. Well, that was a part of the weird thing about buying this house, wasn't it? It's got, it's got a funny little room upstairs. Um, it used to be the toilet, it's an Edwardian house and it used to be the toilet, so it's a tiny, tiny little room that you couldn't do anything useful with. And the estate agents marketed it as a dressing room, which is like, but it's quite clearly a home office. It's quite clearly, you'd, I mean, which is what we use it for now, it's a little tiny office. But just that actual spaces as well, and mm. what people are looking for in spaces and what you expect from a space. And again, I'm aware that I'm really lucky because I've got colleagues, particularly younger colleagues who are renting, for whom working from home is really hard because they're sat on the edge of their bed using the you know in the one room they've got in a shared house yeah I, I think probably another thing about the whole Covid experience is reflecting on how fortunate we are yeah actually because we we weren't in a position where we ran out of anything we neither of us lost our jobs neither of us lost any family members or anybody yeah. well we did but that arguably wasn't Covid related and that was something else you know we've and and having that, however easy it is to feel about that the, the, the world is on fire, you know, there's also the whole, we're really lucky. Mm. And we've come through this, you know, and we're, we're lucky yeah. that we have in the way we have. What do you yeah. think about it? Do you, don't, but, uh, do you know any different? Like, do you, you just no. don't really yeah. remember, do you? No. Well, so got, how do you I've think, got, in 100 years, how do, what, what do you think, what do you think got, the history books, the school books are going to say? The then? thing is, the thing is, I've been saying all the way through... You know, really early on, when all the stuff started happening about people being really aggy about people, you know, stockpiling toilet roll or buying too much in the supermarket or, you know, it's like, 
this is this should change how we look at things like the Second World War because we romanticise that. There's no yeah. doubt in my mind at all. We romanticise everyone pulled together. And don't get me wrong, people had to put up with some really awful stuff and they did that and that was remarkable. But this whole narrative that everybody was just on the same side and there was no nastiness, and there was no human behaviour mm. around <laughs> being in a group. And just, and I was saying, you know, it, this has to change the way we teach kids stuff like the Second World War. You know, yeah. this has to be this. Actually, it gets really, when things get hard, we don't always behave at our best all the time. And that's okay, because that's part of being human. You don't have yeah. to have this group of... People make mistakes. They do. And when you're feeling a bit sad or angry or stressed or worried, you can be a bit mean to other people. Yeah. It's allowed. Yeah, it's part of being human. and It's and, part of life. And also, understanding that and trying to forgive people for it. Yeah. Or, or just sit with it, it's okay. Yeah. And I, I have a feeling that in 100 years' time it'll all be how we roll out banging pans on a Thursday evening and, you know, everybody was all working as one and, and probably the toilet roll stockpiling. But... Yeah, that's me being a bit cynical, maybe. Because that's how we look about things were 70 years ago. Uh, and even though we've got more documentation and more oral history and more records of yeah. the COVID era, I still think people will want to find the happy narrative around it. Or the more positive narrative. I hope there is. I hope, I hope that it, that's what happens, that it's part of a story of there was a, you know, a dark time and things got better. It was a moment of crisis. Yeah rolled in with yeah. Brexit and climate change yeah. and uh, war and there, it was a moment where we kind of hit bottom but then came together and pulled together yeah. and started to be able to work more collectively and make changes sacrifices and changes to make things better uh, I hope I, may, I hope that will be the narrative what do you think Elliot what do you think so in a hundred years time Oh, that might be your children, your grandchildren. What do you think your your grand? What what would what would you want to tell your grandchildren about it? Mm. Is there anything you'd want to say about what it was like to live in a lockdown? And that's a hard question. Isn't yeah, it? it's a big question. If you could put something in a box, if you could put something in a box to give to your grandchildren to say, this is what it was like at this point in my life. What would you put in the box? Mm. That's a that's a really hard <laughs> question too. You were telling us earlier about your octopus book. Do you think your octopus book would be? Yeah, Elliot remembers getting doing some learning about octopuses. Oh yeah. an octopus book. Where we went off on our bit of a. Do you remember doing all the? Oh, do you remember all the crazy things we did to fill time? No. Do you remember we did things like we made we made butter, didn't we? From cream. <laughs> we made cheese. We built a castle out of boxes. We, what else did we do? We did science experiments. Do you remember the science experiments? Yeah, in the cupboard over there. In the cupboard, yeah. So we did all this stuff to try and keep ourselves busy and... Oh, maybe that's what you will remember in a hundred years, having to keep busy and... I think I'd put in the, the homework book that we did for Elliot, which did, which probably chronicles my, my slow descent into completely losing it and all the sort of stuff we ended up doing that went off topic but showed that we were having some fun together and doing some learning together as well, even though it was weird and tricky at times, because it yeah. was.